Hello, my beautiful friends. My name is Kim, and I hope you're having a fabulous day today. If you are interested in true crime stories like I am, I hope that you consider hitting that subscribe button. But either way, hey, thanks for being here. I don't say it enough, but your guys' support really means a lot to me, and it makes dealing with these kinds of cases we're going to be going over, and especially the one we're going over today, so much easier because I feel like we're able to get these stories out there and get people talking about them so we can hopefully see some change that needs to be made in all legal systems around the world to build a better place and a safer place for our little ones. It's rough out there, and today's case is no exception. I want to start out on a better note that today's case did go on to change how child abduction cases are handled and classified in Canada. So we can say that Tori left some sort of legacy behind her, but that doesn't mean that today's case is a happy one. But first, a word from our sponsor. Thanks to Established Titles for sponsoring today's video. Established Titles is so fun because they take the old Scottish custom that anyone who owns land in Scotland, you are considered a lord or a lady. Therefore, Established Titles offers you to buy land. And what is cool is it's just one square foot of land ownership, but this gives you the title of lord or lady. I got one for myself. But I think this is the perfect gift to the person that is so hard to buy for because they have everything. Or for a young one that is into princesses. I managed to get some of my Christmas shopping done early. And so I got these little princesses their own certificate with their name and the title of a lady. And I know they're absolutely going to love this. And they're going to be bragging to their friends of how they are ladies now. What's cool is you can put this on plane tickets or your credit cards. Just imagine you show up with your credit card and you're getting like bad service or something and you're like, look, I am a lady, Lady Kimberly Flower. They have options of Lord or Lady as well as couple packages. You and your partner can have adjoining land. This is perfect for a wedding gift. You get the plot number on the piece of land that you own. Who wants to go with me and check it out in Scotland. Last but definitely not least is that established titles has dedicated themselves to planting a tree with every order and they plant them all over the world. They are partnered with One Tree Planted as well as Trees for the Future organizations to help the efforts of reforestation. This makes me feel good that my purchase is helping the environment. Established Titles is running an early Black Friday sale for my viewers, which you will receive 10% off of your purchase by clicking on my link in the description box below and use the code KimFlower at checkout. That's Established Titles forward slash KimFlower. And of course, as always, the link will be below. The first 200 people purchasing a title pack using my link will effectively be next to my plot within a few minutes of walking distance. Depending on how many of you want to become a lord or lady, we can build our little community, our little Kimberly Flower Rockstar community. Thanks to Established Titles for sponsoring today's video and thanks to all of you for listening. Tori Statford was born Victoria Elizabeth Marie Statford but everybody called her Tori. Her parents were Tara and Rodney. She was born on July 15, 2000 in Woodstock, Canada. She was a bright, sweet girl, and she really got along with her 11-year-old brother. We're going to call him D, who used to walk her back and forth to school every day. Shoot, I, uh, disclaimer, I kind of said it in the beginning, but this case is about a nine-year-old girl with mention of SA and uh, the worst way. Uh, 
this story really made my stomach hurt when I read it. So if this case is too heavy for you, completely get it. I'll have a new video up in a couple of days for you to check out. Or I have a playlist um, with other cases on them. So the brother used to walk her back and forth from school. He was 11 years old. But that was every day except for April 11, 2009, when Tori was just eight years old. Dee had to stay behind after school that day, and Tori started heading back home when she was approached by a woman. They were caught walking together on CCTV cameras, and Tori didn't seem uncomfortable or seem scared by the woman, but this is really one of those times when I wish I could go back there and tell her that she shouldn't have been because Tori never came home that night. The CC cameras last saw Tori and the woman around 3.30 p.m. And by 6 p.m., Tori's grandmother had reported her as missing. Tori lived and was cared for by her mother. We'll get more into her, but yeah, anyways. Her name was Tara McDonald. Tara didn't really seem that worried about her daughter, even though her school was just a few blocks away and that she definitely should have made it home by then, by 6 p.m. But Tara wasn't in a good place. She was a drug addict by all reports that I've seen. Tara McDonald answered frankly about her dependence on drugs, specifically OxyContin, at the time of Tori's disappearance. When investigators realized that up until then, only Tori's grandmother had actually tried to find Tori, and she'd been the one out looking for her and the one who filed the missing persons report. They suspected that Tara knew more about Tori's disappearance than what she was letting on. Tara just did weird junk all through this case. Pointed at me or my family, you know, and I, I just think it's disgusting. I've heard all kinds of shit, and yeah. it's real, pardon my language, but it's really right. starting to frustrate me. People have said, you know, I don't come out here and bawl and cry in front of the cameras and carry on. And, you know, there was somebody who put their kids in their car seats and drove into a lake with their kids, and they went out there and bawled and cried and carried on, and they were the person who was responsible for it. I'm just not the kind of person that can come out here and cry for the cameras every single day. Well, what, what are you kind of saying? Because I was crying and showing my emotions and stuff. I'm behind this. No, I'm not that saying that. I'm saying that's, that. That's the way I took what you just said. No, I'm saying that people get angry because I don't come out here and I can't cry in front of cameras. And so people are holding that against me and saying, that, you know, she's acting this way, so she must have something to do with it. That's just the way that I am. I can't come out here and open up for her. A bunch of strangers and if people can't understand that then sorry this is making me really frustrated Tara because this is your daughter it doesn't matter who should be standing in front of you I could have the world standing here and I would cry I wouldn't care Tori is missing do you what, think Ronnie what... I'm not gonna stand here and fight with you about it okay you know what from now on any of these press conferences okay if you want to do them continue them I will do mine elsewhere because you are showing a total lack of support or support for your daughter. You know no. what? You want to talk about a lack of support okay. for my daughter? Where the hell Keep were going. you for the last nine years? Okay. Where were you for the last? Check nine every one years? of these cameras, every one of these media, every one of those police You've officers. You've been at them now. I but where were you for the last that, nine years? I have told years. them everything from the beginning. Yeah, walk away like usual, Sarah. You're the one who yeah. fucking walk away. Like yeah. But on top of that, the investigators actually believed that Tara was the woman in the CCTV footage, and she did match the description. The footage wasn't clear, so all the investigators knew was that Tori had last been seen with a woman with long, dark hair and wearing a white coat. But it wasn't Tara in the footage and she couldn't tell investigators where Tori was, so Tori stayed missing. The police launched a massive search of the area, and the parents kept their kids home from school when they found out that Tori had gone missing, but even with all this going on, Tori didn't actually qualify for the Canadian standard of being abducted at the time, and they didn't issue an Amber Alert. 
Actually, police only broke the news on local news channels the first night and only started broadcasting nationally the next day. That doesn't seem like a big deal to the novice true crimer, but we know and the police know that every minute counts when it comes to an abduction. Tori would actually be missing for a whole week before law enforcement changed her case from a missing persons to an abduction by then. Had some pretty solid evidence that they weren't looking for Tori, but rather they were looking for a body. They called off all ground searches and told parents to let their children go back to school, but they hadn't actually found Tori. They'd found the woman in the CCTV footage, and her name was Terry Lynn McClinic. She was 18 years old, and she may have cut her hair into a bob to try to change how she looked since the CCTV footage had been released, but she quickly fessed up to taking Tori once investigators brought her in for questioning. Unfortunately for Tara, the mom, things looked bad for her again. Tori's father, Rodney Statford, said that Tara knew Terry Lynn. There is a lot of T names going on in this story. So Tori is our victim, Tara is the mom, and Terry Lynn is the abductor. So hopefully I, I can keep this straight for you because when I was writing it, I'm like, Tori, Terry, Tara, I'm like, ha So anyways, uh, let me say that again, just so it's clear. Tori, our victim's father, said that Tori's mom, Tara, was friends with Terry Lynn, the abductor. Some sources said that Terry Lynn was a drug dealer and she was the one that Tara bought her own supplies from. That dependence, she admitted, led her to the home of the woman now convicted of her daughter's murder, Terry Lynn McClintock. McDonald says she visited the home with her boyfriend twice. She was there to purchase drugs for McClintock's mother. On the second occasion, she met Terry Lynn herself. She, McClintock, was very, very under the influence, said McDonald. But Rodney claimed that Terry Lynn wanted to breed her dog with Tara, and th there, for some reason, that is why Tori was targeted that day after school. It, it's not really clear if, if it was a dog breeding thing or if it was a drug thing. I don't know. Either way, they knew each other. Rodney said that Terry Lynn would have known little Tori's schedule and Tori would have known her enough not to feel nervous walking with her down the street. Tara, the mom, didn't say exactly how she knew Terry Lynn or even if little Tori actually knew her either, but she did say that little Tori was the type of girl who followed someone if, they had, if it had anything to do with animals. And that is exactly what Terry Lynn said that she told Tori that day. So Terry Lynn, our abductor, said that she approached Tori outside her school and told her that she had a puppy in the back of her van. Come on, come see my pretty fluffy puppy. And and of course, Tori is over the moon excited. Oh, I want to see the puppy. And she knew her. She was familiar with her. So it made sense that she followed her. So Tori agreed to go back with Terry Lynn to see the puppy. But what Terry Lynn actually had back in the van was her 28-year-old boyfriend, Michael Rafferty. And he definitely was not a puppy. He was more like a devil if a devil was an animal. Terry Lynn claimed that by then, Michael had been talking about abducting a girl for days. And he would say, the younger, the better, because the younger ones were easier to manipulate. His talks, you're gonna, you're gonna do that today, you're gonna do that today. He uh, had made the comments about young female, so it'd be easy to manipulate. Victoria was the Pretty much the first um, young, like younger female that came out. If I knew like what the, what the outcome of that would have been, I never would have. And that day, Michael had been teasing Terry Lynn and giving her 
a hard time by telling her that she was a chicken, bok, bok, you know, that kind of thing. And she couldn't go through with actually abducting a child. Don't both of these people just sound like wonderful people so far? Terry Lynn decided that she was going to prove him wrong. I'll show you. So around 3.30 p.m. that day, she went up to Tori and told her that there was a puppy in the van. They weren't that far away from the van when Michael stuck his head out the window and started shouting at them both to hurry up. It was then when he stuck his head out that Tori knew something was wrong. But she was too close and Terry Lynn just pushed her and closed the door. Then Terry Lynn climbed in the front seat and Michael started driving. Terry Lynn said that she had no idea where they were actually going or what Michael planned on doing. But when she asked, he said, we can't just keep her and we can't take her back. And then he came up with a plan. He told Terry Lynn that he would drive them out somewhere where he could assault Tori without being disturbed. And that's exactly what he did. And then he said, and we'll take it from there. Terry Lynn agreed, and whenever Tori started crying and asking where they were going, she told her that they were just going for a drive, and then they were going to take her home. But Michael first took them to a Home Depot where Terry Lynn bought a claw hammer, a claw hammer, some garbage bags. They just drove some distance away from where they abducted Tori, much further out than anyone actually was looking for her. They pulled up to an abandoned house off the side of the road and Terry Lynn got out of the car and just walked away. She later admitted in court that she knew what Michael was going to do, and she didn't do anything to stop him, even when she heard Tori screaming. But she did get up and go back to the van when she heard Michael calling for her. He said that Tori needed to go to the bathroom, so Terry Lynn walked a little bit further with Tori down the road, and all the while, Tori is begging Terry Lynn to not take her back to Michael. This part made my stomach turn. It's bad. So I'll put a timestamp when I get past this. And, you know, I don't know if it's just some cases get to me more than others. But for whatever reason, this part just gets me every time. So Terry Lynn told Tori that it wasn't possible and she had to go back to Michael. Terry Lynn later testified that she told Tori that she was sorry and that Tori was actually a very strong girl, much stronger than her. And then she took nine-year-old Tori right back to Michael so he could assault her again. Terry Lynn first agreed to stay with Tori and hold her hand while Michael was assaulting her. But Terry Lynn couldn't stomach the pain and the cries for help to stay for the whole thing. And she ended up walking away. I'm just mind blown. How is this a world that we live in? It's so messed up. Anyways, that's over. And I didn't cry, so I'm not sure if I'm more angry or disgusted. I don't know. I definitely feel sick. Who is worse? Terry Lynn or Michael? Terry Lynn then told investigators that Tori was dead and she did her best to guess where investigators could find her body. Then told Tori's family what Terry Lynn had told them and that she didn't expect to find Tori alive. But without a body, Tori's family kept holding on to hope that she'd come back to them, especially her 11-year-old brother, who probably couldn't even comprehend what was going on. You know, she's there in the morning, and then he gets out of school, and he never sees her again. I'm not even sure how a parent could ever give up hope and believe that their child was really dead without some hard proof. But it was enough for the investigation team. They arrested Terry Lynn and charged her with abducting a minor and accessory to murder. Michael Rafferty was arrested for first-degree murder and are of a minor. 
Michael denied everything, but reporters saw him crying just before the judge walked into court for their first hearing. Nothing was brought in as evidence that day, but they were there to decide if Terry Lynn and Michael would be tried together or separately, and the courts went with separately. They officially pitted Terry Lynn and Michael against each other. But Terry Lynn had already told investigators everything, and she knew about where to find Tori. And Michael, he just wasn't talking. He wasn't saying anything. Giving you the opportunity. You want me to be fair? You want me to listen to both sides? I'm tired. I'm exhausted. I'm still hungry. It's been a long day. It's, and, it's and the next 25 crazy years day. of your life so, are on the line, right? So to, well, it, then it can wait one more day when I talk to a lawyer, and I know exactly exactly all my rights. But an investigator who actually was taken off of Tori's case, he had to help with a, another case for a couple of months, but he was driving down the highway back to Woodstock on July 19th, and he remembered that Michael's phone had pinged off a tower down a path of a road not too far. So he was right there. The investigator was actually heading back for a briefing to talk about searching that particular area. And he couldn't just drive past without checking it out himself. I mean, he's already there. And he spotted the house that Terry Lynn had described. So he pulled off the road and started driving down the dirt path towards um, and as soon as he got out of his car, he saw a pile of rocks that Terry Lynn had told him during the interrogation that they had buried Tori under. He also said that as soon as he got out of the car, he could smell the decomp. And then he found something in some garbage bags under the rocks. He touched it and it was soft. And he later testified that was when he found out that he had found Tori, so he called it in immediately. Tori's body was badly decomposed, especially from the waist down where she was naked. But Tara, the mom, recognized the t-shirt that Tori was wearing, and she knew the butterfly earrings that she had on as well. Tori had actually borrowed them from her mom that morning before she had gone missing, and the dental records came back and confirmed that it was indeed Tori. The autopsy, guys. The autopsy. The report later came back to say that Tori had died from multiple and severe blows to the head done by, guess what, a claw hammer. But she'd also been beaten she had a lacerated liver and 16 broken ribs. 16. Most of you want to pay Michael a visit, but guess what? Terry Lynn still had one more confession to make before the courts and Tori's family. She testified at trial that she'd been the one to kill Tori, not Michael. Up to then, Investigators believed that Terry Lynn was being manipulated by Michael, and they were actually looking to go easier on her. But then she opened her mouth and something horrible came out. She said that after she'd come back to the van and the last time, she seen Tori laying on the ground. She had, in her own words, a flashback. Seeing Tori like that had reminded Terry Lynn of when she'd been assaulted when she was Tori's age, and Terry Lynn flipped. Instead of helping Tori, like one would because she's been there, instead of doing that, she said she became filled with rage, and then she did what she did. She put a plastic bag over Tori's head, and then she started beating her with the hammer. But when Terry Lynn was finally done, Michael helped her bury Tori's body under the rocks, and the two got back into the van and headed home. But on the way, Michael turned to Terry Lynn to do a little mood check and asked her if she was all right, and she said she was. And then she asked him, and he said, yeah, I'm all right too, considering. 
What is wrong with these people? They were both found guilty of first degree murder and both of them were sentenced to life with the possibility of parole after 25 years. And I wish that I could say that it ended there, but it didn't. Honestly, you do enough stories like these and you really start to think that the system is broken everywhere. Michael stuck to his guns and appealed his case, but he thankfully didn't get anywhere with his appeals. But Terry Lynn, good old Terry Lynn, managed to get herself transferred to a, uh, I'm going to call it a mental hospital, but it's, it's a health lodge is what they call it where she planned to serve the rest of her sentence. And I know what you're thinking. Oh, a health lodge. She must have been sick, right? Let me tell you about the health lodge. First of all, this health lodge is supposed to be for indigenous women, but there's no proof that Terry Lynn is actually an indigenous woman, and it's actually a minimum to medium level security prison. It's monitored 24-7 by video cameras and surveillance, but there's no fence around the perimeter of the facility. Basically, it's one of those places where she's pretty much free to do whatever she wants during the day. She's just got to be back in her room by roll call. I'm just, I'm, I'm just hoping this goes really well. <laughs> I'd like to look at just the justice system itself, how how this was able to happen. Um, there's There's got to be loopholes somewhere that Terry Lynn was able to follow through and get to where she is. The sooner we can actually do something about these types of offenders, um, having less and lowered security and um, day passes and stuff like that, it's, it's, it's not right. It's, it's not fair to the victims and it needs to change. I'm very excited and I hope the crowd slowly continues to grow and uh, it's a great feeling knowing that they're willing to come this far to help support the cause and they all know just as well as I do it's it's important. Yeah I'm just I'm, I'm proud I'm proud to be here. To be honest. How? How does someone who abducted a eight nine-year-old who helped by the murder weapon and who sat by while she was assaulted and then brutally killed her get to serve their sentence in a place like this. This woman is dangerous. She's only 18 years old. Just think if she had more wits about her, how creative she could. Understandably, the public went crazy. And I just have to say something here. It doesn't matter which side of the political spectrum you're on. This is a child we're talking about, and someone should remember that when it comes to making decisions about people who hurt them, especially people like Michael and Terry Lynn. A motion was put in by a conservative MP to have Terry Lynn removed removed from the facility and placed back in a regular prison. But every single liberal MP voted against it. They lost the vote 200 to 82. 200, that's way too many people losing sight of what we should be doing as a society and forgetting that we should always try to protect our children. Anyway, before I get too wound up to finish <laughs> this one, Eventually, Terry Lynn's case was handed over to the Correctional Service Canada so they could figure out what to do with Terry Lynn, and they decided that she should be sent back to regular prison. Yes, she should have never been in that other place, thank God. Both of them are currently still serving their sentences, and that's what I hope they will still be doing until the day they die, but they potentially could get parole. I am guessing Terry Lynn will probably get parole, even though she's the murderer, and Michael will probably spend the rest of his life in prison. Female, male, she'll play the victim. You guys tell me your thoughts, but 
Anyways, so far, I'm not holding my breath for either of them. And before I go off on another rant, I'd like to wrap it up for today's case and pass it on to you. What do you think of Tori Stafford's case? And what do you think we could do better to help stop cases like this from happening again? How the investigators handled this did actually lead to them changing their criteria for classifying abductions and had made Amber Alerts more common in Canada. Because they had the abductor, they had the picture of her, it, in America, you know, you have that much information immediately goes to an Amber Alert because it's a, an abduction. But in Canada, they, they at the time, they weren't doing that. So sorry if, if I re-explained something you already knew. But anyways, let's leave a purple heart for Tori in the comments. A lot of people are upset about what has happened and you can see probably behind me a lot of purple. That was Tori Stafford's favorite color and really has become a symbol for people here. For her and her surviving family, especially her brother, I want to thank all of you for stopping by and watching this video here today. But a big thanks to all of my channel members and Patreons who continue to support me. Their names are on the screen. If you would like early access to new videos and decide the cases that I cover next, you can do so by clicking the join button from your desktop, or there's a video in the description box on how to do it from your phone. Well, if you guys have made it to the end, you guys are rock stars and I love you to death. There are more true crime videos in my Crimey Cases playlist for you to check out. Stay safe, my loves. And remember, if you see something, say something. And I'll see you in my next one. Bye. Mm -hmm.